All right, we're going to be in Judges chapter 7 this morning. Welcome everyone here and welcome everyone on Zoom, the Zoom family as I like to call you. Uh, I guess I need to be welcoming Facebook listeners too. Doug and Debbie are with us today. They heard us on Facebook and didn't even know that was a deal. So whoever you are, whenever you are, wherever you are listening to this, welcome. Judges chapter 7, it's, it's a familiar passage of scripture if you read your Bible or heard anything about it. It's uh, talking about Gideon here and his uh, 300 defeating the Midianites. There's been songs sung about this, sermons preached about it, uh, a lot of good stuff in here. Um, Trying to think of where to start. <laughs> it's all good. Um, let's start in verse 7. Judges 7, 7. The Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that laughed will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand and let all the other people go every man to his place. So the people took victuals in their hand and their trumpets and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man into his tent and retained those 300 men, and the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley, and it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down in the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. And if thou fear to go, go thou with Fura thy servant down to the host, and thou shalt hear what they say, and afterwards shalt thine hand be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Fura, his servant, on the outside of the armed men that were in the host, and the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. When Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian, and came into the tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it that the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. It's amazing to me how people interpret dreams. And he got all that from, from that little dream. The Lord must have uh, told him that that's what it was. Verse 15, and it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshiped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And he divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come into the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, ye shall do. When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came into the camp, outside of the camp, in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but nearly set the watch and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands, and the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with all, and they cried the sword of the Lord and Gideon, and they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled, and the three hundred blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host, and the host fled to Bethshira in Zerath, Zerath and the border of Abel, Mihola unto Tabor. I would uh, like to direct your attention to this part of the narrative there in verse 20, where it says the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers. And I want to talk to you a little bit about why the Lord uses broken things. Why the Lord uses broken things. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're thankful for this historical narrative here of Gideon and his 300. And uh, we're thankful, Lord, that 
you were able to use him, Lord, to deliver the children of Israel from the Midianites. We know this happened when it happened for a purpose. And we pray that you'd help us, Lord, to glean some spiritual instruction and wisdom in it, instruction and righteousness. And I pray, Lord, you bless your word and find fertile resting ground on the hearts of those of us who hear it. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I've heard uh, this uh, passage preached before, and uh, it's got a plethora of good material in it, uh, sermon material, teaching material. I, I just like it as a historical story, too. Uh, when I say story, it, it's a fact. It's a narrative here. It really happened. Uh, people say, you believe all that stuff in the Bible? Yeah, it's a history book. It really happened. Gideon took 300 men, and the Lord used him to defeat the Midianites. And they were a host without number. You couldn't get a, an accurate number. There were so many of them. Um, but Gideon, his 300, uh, the Lord used them. Uh, you, you could preach about the army of God. You could preach about the one man and God's majority. Uh, there's all kind of sermon uh, material in that. But this morning, I'd like to take a little bit of a different view or tact or whatever and preach to you about why God uses broken things. Why God uses broken things. There are all kind of ways that the Lord uh, does things that just boggles my mind. Uh, I wouldn't make a good God. Um, I mean, the Lord just does things sometimes that just beyond my comprehension. I just can't fathom it. And Isaiah 55 verse 8, he said, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. <laughs> Amen. I sure are. I, 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 can't, I can't fathom sometimes why the Lord uh, does some of the things he does. Um, I, I do things different than the Lord does. I, that's one of the reasons why he said, uh, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. The Lord's ways are better than our ways. When when God uh, goes to get a job done, a lot of times he, he looks for a, a broken tool to work with, uh, something that maybe was thrown away, something that nobody else would use. Uh, I don't do that. I, 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 I don't like to I don't like to work on a tool that I need to be working with. Right. I don't I don't like I don't want to spend four hours working on my lawnmower when I could want to use it for about 30 minutes to cut the grass. I, I don't in, enjoy work having to work on a tool that's broken or needs something. I used to have a garden tiller and uh, till up the, the garden and wintertime I would either drain the tank or run stable through it and you know, it's going to sit there for several months. Well, uh, sometimes when a, a tool like that sits for a while, it won't start the next spring or the next time you want to use it. But I, I did all this stuff, changed the oil in it, the spark plug, and put the stable in it, and got ready to use it the next year, pulled the thing, and first pull cranked up. And man, I'm thinking, boy, this is great, wonderful, and lovely. I don't have to fool with this thing for four or five hours or however long it takes to try to get it running. It cranked right up. That's what I'm looking for, a tool that's not busted or not broken. You know, I'll guarantee you, I don't know how it is with you ladies. I'm sure it's like this with you too, but you men, you go to a hardware store or Lowe's or Home Depot, you don't go in there looking for busted tools broken tools you don't look for something hey can i spend some time fixing this thing so i can use it to fix something else you don't do that maybe at a thrift store if you find it for the cheap you if it's a good tool that you could work on for just a little bit and get it running but you're not going to pay full price for it you want something that's whole something that's new something that's usable um but i've noticed that the lord for the most part just the opposite of that. He's looking for something that's broken. Uh, you know, thank God he does, because you know, if he, if he was looking for something that wasn't broken, most of us wouldn't get used. Um, nowadays, when we, we if something's broken, nowadays we just—I hate to say it—but most folks just throw it away. We're, we're, we're like a disposable society. 
uh, it used to didn't be like that. I can even remember back in my younger days, my dad fixed stuff, man. He, and that kind of, I guess, wore off on me or reached over into me because I fixed stuff. But, man, people throw away stuff. I think, man, alive. Why are you throwing that away? I must confess, I've been guilty of dumpster diving before. I get stuff uh, out of dumpsters and, and fix it and use it. Sometimes not even broken. I found good stuff in dumpsters that is usable, but people just, for whatever reason, it's the wrong style, or wrong color, just tired of it, just throw it away. Crazy. Uh, and some of it may need some little attention to, uh, to fix it and be usable, but it's a shame that we live in such a disposable society. And, and some of it is legitimate because really it costs more to fix something nowadays than it would to buy something new. Got work was a uh, technician, electronic technician, and it, something went wrong with his refrigerator, 15 year old refrigerator. It needed a, a you know, it's like talking techno savvy stuff, Facebook and all that kind of stuff. He said some stuff. I don't know what he's talking about. It was got a motherboard or computer chip, something in it needed to be replaced. It was 300 bucks on a 15 year old refrigerator. Well, what do you do? Is it bad or not? If you try it, from from what I understand, any kind of electronic stuff, if you try it and it don't work, they're not going to take it back because somebody, you know, you might let the smoke out of it when you hooked it up and it ruined it. They're not going to take it back if that wasn't the problem. What do you do? Spend another 300 for something else? I mean, it just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. So what he do? He threw the refrigerator away and got a new one. We live in a disposable society. I'm glad the Lord's not like that. Amen. He uses broken stuff. In Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17, David said, For thou, hast, thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. A broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. That's what the Lord's looking for. He doesn't despise those things. He doesn't um, uh, put up his nose in the air to broken things. He uses them. Amen? God uses broken things. Why does the Lord do that? Why does he use things that we would usually consider useless or not the best? It's broken. We wouldn't use that. Well, Lord Ben, I'd like to look at some reasons why the Lord uses broken things this morning and hopefully encourage you if you're broken. And I think I'm looking at a room full of broken folks in some way, shape, or form. Uh, the Lord still use you. The Lord used Gideon and he used those vessels that he had, but he used them when they were broken. They wasn't doing their, their function or their purpose or the reason that God had him, as long as they were whole, they were used and let that light shine forth when they were broken. All right. First of all, like I say this, number one, God uses broken things to show us our worth, worthlessness. Is, worthless, is, <laughs> that we're not really worth that much. Well, that's a good way to start it off, isn't it? You go to the thrift store. I like to go to the thrift store with Patty, and I use that as our, uh, I don't know, Leisure time, we've got three stores. <laughs> you can find stuff in there that's broken. Why is it broken? Uh, well, somebody used it, got their use out of it, decided they didn't want it anymore, and they donated to the thrift store. They got rid of it. And you go in there and pick up something that's broken. Uh, it's To them, it was worthless. Well, God takes those worthless things and uses them. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12, Isaiah wrote, Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with a span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who, who's done that? Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord or being his counselor hath taught him? With whom took he counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. You get that 
scale there with the balance on it. It's got some dust in it. You don't even pay it any mind, any attention. The small dust is not going to affect it one way or the other. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. Verse 17 of Isaiah chapter 40 says, All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. I'm not sure how you would compute the sum of less than nothing, but there it is. <laughs> when God looks at the nations, they're less than nothing. Less than nothing. And we, we think we're all at the bag of chips, and God looks at it and says all the nations put together like a drop in the bucket, like the small dust on the scale. They're less than nothing in vanity. You know, don't get the big head thinking, well, oh, God used me because I'm all that in a bag of chips. He looks at us and says, nothing. Comparatively speaking, back in the, the 50s, uh, Norman Vincent Peale wrote that book on the power of positive thinking. I haven't read it. I've read some excerpts from it. It kind of got to the, 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 the flavor of pop psychology to me, so... I, I didn't read all of it, but as a as a society and a culture, man, we've we've come to the point where we think we're all that and a bag of chips and a large fry on the side and a frosty milkshake, and we think we're all this and all that. And we're just the, the the greatest thing since sliced bread. We've got a culture and a heritage that is just positively thinking their way to hell. Now, maybe if you compare yourself with other people, maybe you are great and wonderful, but that's not the comparison. The Bible says over in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Well, if you're not wise, what are you? A fool. <laughs> You're comparing yourselves among yourselves. That's foolish. Well, I'm better than so-and-so because, well, maybe you are, but you, that's the wrong standard. Jesus Christ is the standard, and compa compared to him, we're pretty much worthless. And I don't mean to kick you in the teeth and have you go around and look like you sucking on persimmons and all that just depressed and stuff. Maybe, you know, there is a place for rejoicing in the Lord and and uh, again, I say rejoice and, and confidence in Christ and things like that. But uh, the, Lord, the Lord told those disciples one time, he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth fruit. He said, without me, ye can do nothing. Nothing. Without Jesus Christ, we're worthless. And God allows you to be broken to see that. Amen. That's one of the purposes of him allowing us to be broken, to, to be able to see our worthlessness without him. I mean, really, it shouldn't be that hard to see, but people get people get ideas, man. Uh, let me tell you something. I'll, I'll show you an illustration of how easy it should be to see that. You know where you're headed this morning, unless the Lord comes back? You're headed for a hole in the ground, and worms are going to eat your flesh. And all your wisdom and intellect and all the stuff that you beauty, all that stuff's going to be gone, folks. Gone. I think it was Einstein when he died, he didn't want his the people want to study his brain. He didn't want that to happen. Somebody, you know, if you did, you don't get a say in the thing. Somebody got his brain dissected and sent it to different scientists and stuff study that thing out and I think some of them just what good thing that happened to parts of those segments like it flushed down the toilet and the sewer and stuff like that Einstein's brain oh, yeah man worthless worthless compared to God that's what we are compared to each other maybe not but comparing yourselves among themselves they're not wise we're headed for a hole in the ground without the Lord coming back and intervening we're going to die Back there in the Old Testament, Abraham and Sarah married for years and years. And she finally died. And, and uh, Abraham needed to buy a, a place, a, a burial place for her. 
And uh, he, he told them, he said, I'm, I'm a stranger and a sojourner with you. He said, give me a possession of a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Out of my sight. That's why they put you in a hole in the ground, get you out of the sight. I don't care how loved you are, how well esteemed you are, how great you are. When you're dead, they're going to put you in a hole in the ground or cremate you or something like that. Paul talking about the Jews over there in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. He said, what advantage then hath the Jew or what profit is there of circumcision? In verse 2, he said, much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. They would say, you a white supremacist? Uh, no, I'm a Jewish supremacist. <laughs> <laughs> he, he said man, he said what profit hath the Jew he said much in every way yeah. are you going to deny that not only did God say it but the Jewish race if you want to call them a race is pretty much proven it and all the, the, the Nobel prizes they've got all the inventions they've got all the great things they've done kind of Makes you feel kind of weak and anemic, doesn't it? But even if that, in Romans chapter 3, verse 9, he said, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jew and Gentile that they are all under sin. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. <laughs> they, might, they might have some advantages, <clears throat> but... The comparison ain't among ourselves. It's with Jesus Christ. And compared to him, all his sin had come short of the glory of God. Folks, spiritually speaking, we're just worthless. God has to break us to get us to see that. <clears throat> Joseph had those dreams. I've always thought this. That he, as a teenager, he had those dreams. I, I, I can't help but think that it kind of went to his head a little bit. I mean, his family bowing down to him and worshiping him. Those dreams that he had twice. It's like, mm, yeah, buddy, can't wait for, can't wait to be king. <clears throat> well, he had a, a journey to get to that point, and it involved being uh, betrayed by his brothers and sold as a slave, falsely accused, put in prison. I mean, he's going down, down, down. He's going in the opposite direction of a throne. Amen. The Bible says over there in Psalm 105, verse 17, he sent a man before them, talking about the Lord sending Joseph. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. What did he do? He broke him. He broke him of that pride. He put him down. He uses broken vessels, folks, to show us that we within ourselves are pretty much worthless without him you can do nothing amen i'll skip that part seem like it might be stifling the, the spirit a little bit there <laughs> yeah we get all proud and, and haughty and and arrogant about things, man. And the Lord says, okay, I'm going to do you like Gideon's vessel there. I'm going to have to break you so I can use you and let that light shine out of you. Amen? So people see Jesus Christ and not you. All right, secondly, not only does he use broken things to show us uh, our worthlessness, but secondly, to show his greatness. Amen? I mean... Like I said, who chooses broken things to use? Somebody that can use broken things. Um, like I said, I choose uh, new things, whole things, intact things, things that I don't have to worry about failing me when I need them most. Amen? That's what I'm looking for, a tool to use. God looks for something that's broken, so he'll receive the glory for it. Look back there and we're in Judges chapter 7, verse number 1. It says, Then Jerubbabel, who was Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill and Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. 
<laughs> he started off with 32,000 people, got it whittled down to 10,000. The Lord's still saying that that's too much, too many, because I know what you'll do. If, if you defeat the Midianites, even though they're a, a, an innumerable host, you'll brag about it. That's what vaunt themselves means. You'll brag about it. You'll get all puffed up about it. <laughs> like you did that for yourself. But we're going to whittle them down. He whittled them down to 300 people. Now who gets the glory for it? The Lord does. When the Lord uses broken things, he gets the glory for it. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light. He had to make you meet because you wasn't before. You wasn't fitting to, to associate with good folks. Amen. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son and whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. In all things he might have the preeminence, including what he uses you for. He gets something done using a broken tool. He gets the credit for it. He gets the honor for it. He gets the glory for it. He gets the preeminence. If you aren't broken, you, you steal the glory. If you aren't broken, you get the praise. If you aren't broken, if you're not careful, you get the recognition. So God allows you to be broken to show you that you need him to accomplish anything. Over there in Revelation 4.11, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You were created to bring glory and honor and pleasure to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're not broken, you, 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 you stand a chance of uh, glorifying yourself. Look what I did. Amen. So the Lord allow you to be broken. <clears throat> I remember reading over there in Matthew with the Lord uh, called the disciples unto himself. And, and he's got a multitude there and he said, uh, feed them. And he said, we ain't got nothing to feed them. Well, I got these uh, few fishes and loaves. And, and he said, well, have them sit down and, and bring those loaves and fishes. And the first thing he did after he gave thanks, the Bible says he broke. He broke that bread, broke those loaves. Why did he break them? You don't think he could have just said whatever he did to <laughs> multiply the broken pieces. He could have done that with the loaves and let them break them. God uses broken things. He uses broken pieces. <laughs> Break them. There's a picture of him breaking his body for us to have eternal life. Amen. Amen. They weren't uh, they weren't multiplied until they were broken. They weren't sufficient until they were broken. They weren't advantageous to the multitude until they were broken. And neither will you be. He received glory and honor when those were broken and fed the multitude with them. Who gets the glory in your life? Is it your great brain? Is it your great intellect? Is it your great talent, your power, and your ability, and all that kind of stuff? Or is it God? Yeah. Amen. It ought to be God. God uses broken things to show us our worthlessness. He uses broken things to glorify himself. And last of all, I'd like to say this. He uses broken things so we'll set our affections on things above. You know, if everything was right down here, why would you want to go to heaven? There's something wrong with everything and everybody down here. Amen. Including you. There's something wrong with you. <laughs> and it's not going to be fixed until you get a new body and get to heaven. And I'm longing for that day. I, I tell you, man, I, I'm tired of being broke and busted. Amen. Something wrong all the time. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10, 
And Paul said, for it is written, I have not seen or ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Most people stop there, but I'm going to continue with verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. He's revealed some things to us. And one of those things he's revealed to us is what he has prepared for us in heaven. Maybe not all the details of it, but we know we know enough to want to go there. <laughs> we know it ain't broken. Amen. <laughs> we know it's a place where there's no sin, no sickness, no sorrow, no death. Yeah. Amen. I'm ready to go. We got a little got a little revelation of a little taste of I remember my mom, she used to make a carrot cake. She was talking about that the other day. And uh, usually that was one of the main dishes around things or main dessert dishes. Uh, she made it in a, in a bunt pan. And when she would get done with the cake, she would poke holes in it and make this orange glazed icing and pour that on. It was soaked down in that carrot cake pan. It was good. <coughs> when she get finished with that, she would give us the bowl and a spoon and the beaters and stuff, and we'd <laughs> we'd tear that stuff up. Man, raw raw eggs, <laughs> she's raw eggs and stuff. You couldn't do that nowadays. I mean, you'd probably get some kind of sickness. People say, "How come you don't get sick too much?" <laughs> well, I was exposed to so much when I was <laughs> when I was growing up. Man, probably got antibodies in me left over for for years to come. Now I don't know if that's true or not, but. We would we would eat that man eat that raw cake batter and uh, icing just tear it up man it was so good and then when the cake come out people would be wondering well, I wonder if it had carrot cakes any good because when you say carrot cake have you never had one before carrot cake it's almost like zucchini bread the first time I somebody asked me about zucchini bread I said well I don't like zucchini I'm sure I'm not gonna like zucchini bread I was wrong <laughs> I like zucchini bread. But that carrot cake, you, you say carrot cake, that just seems in Congress. That don't seem like it's something that would go together. But I knew it was going to be good because I had licked the spoon. Amen. I know heaven's going to be good because I licked the spoon. <laughs> Down here just a little bit. Amen. Now, uh, we're going we're gonna to go to a place where, where things aren't broken. But until then, God uses broken things to show us our worthlessness, his greatness and to help us set our affections on things above in Colossians three, one Paul said for, if he then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above for Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth for your dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Don't we serve a great God? We do. And thank God that he uses broken things. So I'm just not qualified. Well, <laughs> you might be, you may not be if, you, if you're not broken. Why don't you uh, repent and, and get right with God and have a broken and contrite spirit and the Lord will use you because he uses broken things. I'm glad he does. And I tell you what, I am so glad that we're going to a place, if you're saved, I'm going to a place where things aren't broken anymore. Everything will be just right. And if you're listening to this this morning, you're not saved. If you want to go to a place like that, the Lord Jesus Christ was broken on the cross of Calvary for your sins. He died. He was buried. He rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And he'll save you if you'll trust him. And you can go to a place where there's nothing broken. Nothing wrong, no sorrow, no sickness, no death, no pain. All sorrow is passed away. If you want to go to a place like that, trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, and he'll save you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're thankful that you use broken things. And I know it's uh, the process of being broken is not enjoyable. It's not something that we would seek out for ourselves, Lord, but we're thankful that you've allowed us to be broken from time to time that you might use us and you receive the honor and glory in that. And Lord, it helps us set our affections on things above. We're looking forward to going to a place where things aren't broken. We pray if at all possible, the Lord Jesus Christ would come back today. If not, help us to do what we can for thee while we're down here. Lord, help us to be faithful. Bless your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take a break.